Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I am reading The Skylarker, Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garby. I am reading Chapter 4. Chapter 4 Steel Liberates Energy Unexpectedly. Duchesne was in his laboratory poring over an abstruse article in a foreign journal of science when Scott came breezily in with a newspaper in his hand, across the front page of which stretched great headlines. Hello, Blackie, he called. Come down to earth and listen to this tale of mystery from the world-renowned fount of exactitude and authority, the Washington Clarion. Some miscreant has piled up and touched off a few thousand tons of TNT and picric acid up in the hills. Read about it. It's good. Duchesne read. Mysterious explosion. Mountain village wiped out of existence. 200 dead. None injured. Force felt all over the world. Cause unknown. Scientists baffled. Harper's Ferry, March 26. At 10.23 a.m. today, the village of Bankerville, about 30 miles north of this place, was totally destroyed by an explosion of such terrific violence that seismographs all over the world recorded the shock. And the windows were shattered even in the city. A thick pall of dust and smoke was observed in the sky, and parties set out immediately. They found, instead of the little mountain village, nothing except an immense crater-like hole in the ground some two miles in diameter, and variously estimated at from two to three thousand feet deep. The entire village, with its two hundred inhabitants, has been wiped out of existence. Not so much as a splinter of wood or a fragment of brick from any of the houses can be found. Scientists are unable to account for the terrific force of the explosion, which far exceeded that of the most violent explosive uh, known. Hmm. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? said Dishing sarcastically as he finished reading. Sure does, replied Scott, grinning. What do you suppose it was? Think the reporter heard a tire blow out on Pennsylvania Avenue? Perhaps. Nothing to it, anyway, as he turned to his work. As soon as the visitor had gone, a sneering smile spread over Duchesne's face, and he picked up his telephone. The fool did it. That will cure him of sucking eggs, he muttered. Operator, Duchesne speaking. I'm expecting a call this afternoon. Please ask him to call me at my home. Thank you. Fred, he called to his helper. If anyone wants me, tell them I have gone home. He left the building and stepped into his car in less than half an hour. He arrived at his house on Park Road overlooking beautiful Rock Creek Park. Here he lived alone, save for an old colored couple who were his servants. In the busiest part of the afternoon, Chambers rushed unannounced into Brookings' private office. His face was white as chalk. Read that, Mr. Brookings, he gasped, thrusting the clarin extra into his hand. Brookings read the news of the explosion, then looked at his chief chemist, his face turning gray. Yes, sir, that was our laboratory, said Chambers dully. The fool, didn't you tell him to work with small amounts? I did. He said not to worry. They was taking no chances that he would never have more than a gram of copper on hand at once in the whole laboratory. Well, I'll be damned. Slowly turning to the telephone, Brookings, Brookings called a number and asked for Dr. Duchesne, then called another. Brookings speaking. I'd like to see you this afternoon. Will you be at home? I'll be there in about an hour. Goodbye. When Brookings arrived, he was shown into Duchesne's... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> when Brookings arrived, he was shown into Duchesne's study. The two men shook hands perfunctionally and sat down, the scientist waiting for the other to speak. Well, Duchesne, you were right. Our man couldn't handle it. But of course you didn't mean the terms you mentioned before. Duchesne smiled a cold, hard smile. You know what I said, Brookings? Those terms are now doubled. Twenty thousand and ten million. Nothing else goes I expected it since you never backed down. The corporation expects to pay for its mistakes. We accept your terms, and I have contracts here for your services as research director at a salary of 240000 per annum, with the bonus and royalties you demand. 
Duchesne glanced over the documents and thrust them into his pocket. I'll go over these with my attorney tonight and mail one back to you if he approves the contract. In the meantime, <clears throat> we may as well get down to business. What would you suggest? asked Brookings. You people stole the solution, I say. Don't use harsh language, doctor. It's, why not? I'm for direct action, first, last, and all the time. This thing is too important to permit of mincing words or actions. It's a waste of time. Have you the solution here? Yes, here it is. Drawing the little ball from his pocket. Where's the rest of it? Duchesne noted as he saw the size of the bottle. All that we found is here except about a teaspoonful which the expert had to work on, replied Brookings. We didn't get it all, only half of it. The rest was diluted with water so that it wouldn't be missed. After we get started, if you find it works out satisfactorily, we can procure the rest of it. That will certainly cause a disturbance, but it may be necessary. Half of it, interrupted Duchesne. You haven't one twentieth of, of it here. When I saw it on the bureau, seen had about 500 milliliters, over a pint of it. I wonder if you're double-crossing me again. Hmm. No, you're not, he continued, paying no attention to the other's protestations of innocence. You're paying me too much to want to block me now. The crook you sent out to get the stuff turned in only this much. Do you suppose he's holding out on us? No. You know Perkins and his methods. He missed the main bottle then. That's where your methods make me tired. When I was anything done, I believe in doing it myself. Then I know it's done right. As to what I suggest, that's easy. I will take three or four Perkins gunmen tonight. We'll go out there and raid the place. We'll shoot Seaton and anybody else who gets in the way. We'll dynamite the safe and take the solution plans, notes, money, and anything else we want. No, no, doctor. That's too crude altogether. If we have to do that, let it be only as last resort. I say do it first, so we know we will get results. I tell you, I'm afraid of pussyfooting and gumshoeing about Seton and Crane. I used to think that Seton was easy, but he seems to have developed greatly in the last few weeks. And Crane never was anybody's fool. Together, they make a combination hard to beat. Brute force applied without warning is our best bet, and there's no danger. You know that. We've got away clean with this. Lots worse stuff. It's always dangerous, and we could wink at each other's tactics only after everything else has failed. Why not work it out from the solution we have, and then quietly get the rest of it? After we have it worked out, Seton might get into an accident on his motorcycle. And we could prove by the state of development of our plans that we discovered it long ago. Because developing the stuff is highly dangerous, as you have found out. Even Seton wouldn't have been alive now if he hadn't had a lot of luck at the start. Then, too, it would take too much time. Seton has already developed it, you see. I haven't been asleep, and I know what he has done just as well as you do. And why should we go through all that slow and dangerous experimental work when we can get their notes and plans as well as not? There's bound to be trouble anyway when we steal all their solution, even though they haven't missed this little bit of it yet. It might as well come now as any other time. The corporation is amply protected, and I'm still a government chemist. Nobody even suspects I am in on this deal. I'll never see you except after hours and in private, and will never come near your offices. We'll be so cautious that even if anyone should get sup suspicious, they can't possibly link us together. Until they do link us together, we are all safe. No, Brookins, a raid is the force. A raid in force is the only sure and safe way. What is more natural than a burglary of a rich man's house? It will be a simple affair. The police will stir around for a few days and it will be forgotten and we can go ahead. Nobody will suspect anything except Crane if he is alive. And he won't be able to do anything. So the argument raged. Brookings was convinced that Duchesne was right in wanting to get possession of all the solution and also of the working notes and plans, but would not agree to the means suggested, holding out for quieter, more devious, but less actionable methods. Finally, he ended the argument with a flat refusal to countenance the rays, and the science w scientist was forced to yield, although he declared that they would have to use his methods in the end and that it would save time, money, and perhaps lives if they, were, they used it first. Brookings then took from his pocket his wireless and called Perkins. He told him of the larger bottle of solution, instructing him to secure it and to bring back all plans, notes, and other materials he could find, which in any way pertained to the matter in hand. Then, after promising Duchesne to keep him informed of developments and giving him an instrument similar to the one he himself carried, Brookings took his leave. Hmm.
Seaton had worked from early morning until late at night, but had rigorously kept his promise to Dorothy. He had slept seven or eight hours every night and called upon her regularly, returning from the visits with ever keener zest for his work. Late in the afternoon upon the day of the explosion, Seaton stepped into Crane's shop with a massive notes in his hand. Well, Mart, I've got it, some of it at least. The power is just what we figured. It's so immensely large as to be beyond belief, I have found. First, there's practically irresistible pull along the axis of the treated wire or bar. It is apparently focused at infinity, as near by objects are not affected. Second, I have studied two of the borderline regions of current we discussed. I found that in one of the power is liber liberated as a similar attractive force, but is focused upon the first object in line with the axis of the bar. As long as the current is applied, it remains focused upon that object no matter what comes between. In the second borderline condition, the power is liberated at, as a terrific repulsion. Third, the copper is completely transformed into available energy, there being no heat, whatever, liberated. Fourth, most important of all, that the X acts only as a catalyst for the copper and is not itself consumed, so that an infinitesimal thin coating is all that is required. You have certainly found out a great deal about it, replied Crane, who had been listening with the closest attention, a look of admiration upon his face. You have all the essential facts right there. Now we can go ahead and put in the details, which will finish up the plans completely. Also, one of those points solves my hardest problem, that of getting back to the earth after we lose sight of it. We can make a small bar in the, that borderline condition and focus it upon the earth. We can use that repulsive property to ward off any meteorites which may come too close to us. That's right. I never thought of using those points for anything. I found them out incidentally and merely mentioned them as interesting facts. I have a model of the main bar belt, though, that will lift me into the air and pull me all around. Want to see it work? I certainly do. As they were going out to the landing field, Shiro called to them and they turned back to the house, learning that Dorothy and her father had just arrived. <clears throat> Hello, boys, Dorothy said, bestowing a radiant smile upon them both as Seaton seized her hand. Dad and I came out to see that, that you were taking care of yourself and to see what you were doing. Are visitors allowed? No, replied Seaton promptly. All visitors are barred. Members of the firm and members of the family, however, are not classed as visitors. You came at the right time, said Crane, smiling. Dick has just finished a model and was about to demonstrate it to me when you arrived. Come with us and watch the... I object, interpreting it as highly undignified performances yet, and objection overruled, interposed the lawyer decisively. You are too young and impetuous to have any dignity. Therefore, any performance not undignified would be impossible a priori. The demonstration will proceed. Laughing merrily, the four made their way to the testing shed in which in front of which Satan donned a heavy, heavy leather harness, buckled up his shoulders, body, and legs, to which were attached to numerous handles, switches, boxes, and other pieces of apparatus. He snapped the switch which started the Tesla coil in the shed and pressed a button on an instrument in his hand attached to his harness by a small steel cable. Instantly there was a creak of straining metal, and he shot vertically into the air for perhaps a hundred feet, where he stopped and remained motionless for a few moments. Then the watcher saw him point his arm and dart in the direction in which he pointed. By merely pointing, apparently, he changed his direction at will, going up and down, backward and forward, describing circles and loops and figures of eight. After a few minutes of this display, he descended slowly by abruptly, as slowing up abruptly as he neared the ground and making an easy landing. There, obedient lady and esteemed sirs, he began with low bow and sweeping flourish. When there was a snap and he was jerked sideways off his feet, inbounding his cumbersome heart, his head pressed the controlling switch and the instrument he held in his hand, which contained the power plant or bar, and tore itself loose from its buckle. Instead of being within easy reach of his hand, it was over six feet away and was dragging us helplessly after it straight toward the high stone wall. But only momentarily was he helpless, his keen mind discovering a way out of the predicament, even as he managed to scramble to his feet in spite of the rapid pe fa pace. Throwing his body sideways and reaching out his long arm as far as possible toward the bar, he succeeded in swinging it around so that he, he was running back toward the party and a spacious landing field. Dorothy and her father were standing motionless 
staring at Seton. The former with terror in her eyes, the latter in blank amazement. Crane had darted to the switch controlling the coil and was reaching for it when Seton passed him. Don't touch the switch, he yelled. I'll catch that thing yet. At this evidence that Seton still thought himself master of the situation, Crane began to laugh, though he still kept his hand near the controlling switch. Dorothy, relieved of her fear for her lover's safety, could not help but join him, so ludicrous were Seton's actions. The bar was straight out in front of him, about five feet above the ground, going somewhat faster than a man could run. It turned now to the right, now to the left, as his weight was thrown to one side or the other. Seton, dragged along like a small boy trying to hold a runaway calf by the tail, was covering the ground in prodigious leaps and bounds, at the same time pulling himself up hand over hand to the bar in front of him. He soon reached it seized it in both hands, and again darted into the air, descended lightly near the others who were rocking with laughter. I said it would be undignified, chuckled Seaton, rather short of breath, but I didn't know just how much it was going to be. Dorothy tucked her fingers into his hand. Are you hurt anymore, Dick? Not a bit. He led me a great chase, though. I was scared to death until you told Martin to let the switch alone, but it was funny then. I hadn't noticed your resemblance to a jumping jack before. Won't you do it again sometime and let us take a a movie of it? That was as good as any show in town, Dick, said the lawyer, wiping his eyes. But you must be more careful. Next time it might not be funny at all. There will be no next time for this rig, replied Seaton. This is merely to show us that our ideas are all right. The next trip will be a full-scale, completely equipped boat. It was perfectly wonderful, declared Dorothy. I know this first flight of yours will be turning port or something in history. I don't pretend to understand how you did it. The sight of you standing still up there in the air made me wonder if I really were awake, even though I knew what to expect. But we wouldn't have missed it for the world, would we, Dad? No, I'm very glad that we saw the first demonstration. The world has never before seen anything like it, and you two men will rank as two of the great discoverers. <clears throat> Seatonwell, you mean, replied Crane, uncomfortably. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. It's nearly all yours, denied Seaton. Without your ideas, I would have lost myself in space in the, my first attempt. You're both wrong, said Vainman. You, Martin, haven't enough imagination, and you, Dick, have altogether too much for either of you to have done this alone. The honor will be divided equal, equally between you. Hmm. He turned to Crane as Dorothy and Seaton set out toward the house. What are you going to do with it commercially? Dick, of course, hasn't thought of anything except the space car. Equally, of course, you have. Yes, knowing the general nature of power and confident that Dick could con would control it, I have already drawn up sketches for a power plant installation of 500,000 electrical horsepower, which will enable us to sell power for less than one-tenth of a cent per kilo kilowatt hour and still return 20% annual dividends. However, the power plant comes after the flyer. Why? Why not build the power plant first and take the pleasure trip afterward? There are several reasons. The principal one is that Dick and I would rather be off exploring new worlds while the other members of the Seaton Crane Company engineers build this power plant. During the talk, the man had reached the house into which the others had disappeared some time before. Upon Crane's invitation, Vayman and his daughter stayed to dinner, and Dorothy played for a while upon Crane's wonderful violin. The rest of the evening was spent in animated discussion of the realization of Seton's dreams of flying without wings and beyond the supporting atmosphere. Seton and Crane did their best to explain to the non-technical visitors how such flight was possible. Well, I'm beginning to understand a little, said Dorothy finally. In plain language, it is like a big magnet or something, but different. Is that it? That's it exactly, Seton assured her. What are you going to call it? It isn't like anything else that ever was. Already this evening you've called it a bus, a boat, a kite, a star hound, a wagon, an aerial fliver, a sky chariot, a space-eating wampus, I don't know what else. Even Martin has called it a vehicle, a ship, a bird, and a shell. What is its real name? I don't know. It hasn't got any that I know of. What would you suggest, Dottie? I don't know. The general name should be applied to them. For this one, there's only one possible name. The Skylark. Exactly right, Dorothy said to Crane. Fine, cried Seaton. Then you shall christen it, Dottie, with a big Florence flask full of absolute vacuum. I christen you the Skylark. Bang! 
As guests were leaving at a late hour, Vanman said, Oh, yes, I bought an extra clarion as we came out. It tells a wild tale of an explosion so violent the science cannot, science cannot explain it. I don't suppose it is true, but it may make interesting reading for you t- scientific sharps. Good night. Seaton accompanied Dorothy to the car, bidding her a more intimate farewell on the way. When he returned, Crane, with an unusual expression of concern on his face, handed in the paper without a word. "'What's up, old man?' something in it, he asked, as he took the paper. He fell silent as he read the first words, and after he had read the entire article, he said slowly, "'True beyond a doubt. Even clearing reporter can't imagine that. It's all intra-atomic energy, all right. Some poor devil trying our stunt without my horseshoe in his pocket. Think, Dick. Something is wrong somewhere. You know that two people did not discover X at the same time. The answer is that somebody stole your idea, but the idea is worthless without the X. You say that stuff is extremely rare. Where did they get it? That's right, Mart. I never thought of that. That stuff is extremely rare. I am supposed to know something about rare metals, and I never heard of it before. There's an even a gap in the periodic system in which it belongs. I have bet a hat that we have every milligram known to the world at present. Well then, said the practical crane, we had better see whether or not we have all we started with. Asking Cheryl to bring the large bottle from the vault, he opened the living room safe and brought forth the small vial. The large bottle was still nearly full, the seal upon it broke and broken. The vial was apparently exactly as Seaton had left it after he'd made his bars. Our stuff seems to be out there. It looks as though someone else has discovered it also. I don't believe it, said Seaton. The position's now reversed. It's altogether too rare. He scanned both bottles narrowly. I can tell by taking the densities, he added, and ran up to the laboratory, turning with a Westfall balance in his hand. After testing both solutions, he said slowly, Well, the mystery solved. The large bottle has a specific gravity of 1.80, as it had when I prepared it. That in the vial reads only 1.41. Somebody has burglarized this safe and taken almost half of the solution, filling the vial up with colored water. The stuff is so strong that I would never have noticed the difference. Who could it have been? Search me. But it's nothing to worry about now anyway, because whoever it was is gone where he'll never do it again. He's taken the solution with him too so that nobody else can get it. I wish we were sure of that, Dick. The man who tried to do the research work is undoubtedly gone, but who is back of him? Nobody, probably. Who would want to be? To borrow your own phrase, Dick, Scott chirped it when he called you nobody home. For a man with your brains, you have the least sense of anybody I know. You know that this thing is worth, as a power project alone, thousands of millions of dollars, and that there are dozens of big concerns who would cheerfully put us both out of the way for thousandth of that amount. The question is not to find one concern who might be backing a thing like that, but to pick out the one who is backing it. Hmm. After thinking deeply for a few moments, he went on. The idea was taken from a demonstration in the Bureau, either by an eyewitness or by someone who heard about it afterward, probably the former. Even though it failed, one man saw the possibility. Who was that man? Who was there? Oh, a lot of fellows were there. Scott, Smith, Penfield, Duchesne, Roberts, quite a bunch of them. Let's see, Scott hasn't the brains enough to do anything. Scott doesn't know anything about anything except Amanese. Penfield is a pure scientist who wouldn't even quote an authority without asking permission. Duchesne is um, Duchesne, uh, Yes, Duchesne, I've heard of him. He's a big black fellow about your own size. He has the brain's ability and the inclination, has he not? Well, I wouldn't want to say that. I don't know him very well. And personal dislike is no ground at all for suspicion, you know. Enough to warrant investigation. Is there anyone else who might have reasoned it out as you did and as Duchesne possibly could? Not that I remember, but we can count Duchesne out anyway because he called me up this afternoon about some notes on Gallium. So he's still in the Bureau. Besides, he wouldn't let anybody else investigate it if he got it. He would do it himself, and I don't think he would have blown himself up. I never did like him very well. Personally, he's such a cold, inhuman son of a fish. But you've got to hand it to him for ability. He's probably the best man in the world today on that kind of thing. No, I don't think that we will count him out yet. He may have had nothing to do with it, but as we have, we will have him investigated nevertheless and will guard against future visitors here. 
Turning to the phone, he called the private number of a well-known detective. Prescott? Crane speaking. Sorry to get you out of bed, but I would should like to have a complete report on the Dr. Mark C. Deschain of the Rare Metals Laboratory as soon as possible. Every detail for the last two weeks, every move, every thought if possible. Please keep a good man on him until further notice. I wish you would send two or three guards out here right away tonight. Men you can trust and who will stay awake. Thanks. Good night. And this is the end of Chapter 4.